Our next lecture is going to be about occasional backups, and it's going to be held by Mac Lemon. So enjoy. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Mac Lemon. You can find me on the interwebs and on the Fediverse on Mastodon if you want to, and if you want to live toot or tweet about this uh, talk or poke some fun at me, uh, please use that hashtag so others can find your messages as well. Um, quick show of hands, who of you is doing backups? That's about 80%. I consider that a well-meant lie. <laughs> okay, um, backups. What do we want? Anything? Restore. Restore. Yes, we want that good, warm, fuzzy feeling when we found out that we lost some data or somebody else's data. And when do we want that? Immediately? Yeah. After a few minutes when the anxiety tones down when you found out that you lost data. Um, OK, what does backup mean? It's quite easy to back up. To back up someone uh, means to support a person or a cause. Nice. Um, your backup is actually a feeling that's a cold, moist feeling that climbs up your spine when you find out, ah, I've lost some data. It's getting uncomfortable. Um, backup, as in move, 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 um, is what you do when you found out that you lost data and you want to hide in the double flooring of your data center. <laughs> it's like a shiny dark cavern out there. Uh, and to be back up on your feet means this is a feeling that you have when you found the backup data and could somebody somehow restore it. Uh, and to back up is going against the normal flow of direction, which is also. So if somebody says backup, 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 you certainly know what that means now. And with that uh, set, how much could you lose? That's the central question with data. Um, any ideas? That is a punch card from the, I think, 70s, around-ish? How much data is on a punch card? Some are younger than punch cards, I know. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah. So that can hold 80 bytes of data. There's a checksum bit in there. I don't count that. 80 bytes for a single punch card. Or you could just drop a whole stack of punch cards and lose the order of punch cards, and now your executable doesn't run anymore. So it's not all about data. Um, backups, uh, they adhere to a few laws. You know laws. There's certainly Murphy's Law. Show of hands. Who knows Murphy's Law? Who has experienced it personally? <laughs> yeah. For those who have not heard about Murphy's Law, it means anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Easy. That certainly applies to backups. Uh, then there's Finnegal's law of dynamic negatives. It already sounds negative because it is. A huh? lot fewer hands. Huh? A few, OK. One, at least one. OK. Two. Huh? Um, anything that can go wrong will. Well, so far, that's the same as Murphy's at the worst possible moment. That's certainly a welcome addition. And then there's Hofstetter's law. The Douglas R. Hofstetter, you might have read Gödel Escher Bach, or at least you have it on your shelf to impress your friends. Hmm? And it says it always takes longer than you expect, even when you take into account Hofstetter's law. That's probably more related to restore. So how much could you lose? That's an audio tape. There's a backup of a game called Pitfall on there. And backups also do have pitfalls. That was uh, for the Texas Instrument 994A. Um, a tape cassette with 60 minutes, it, back in the days, it holds uh, 200 kilobytes per side. So you could lose 400 kilobytes. And uh, 400 kilobytes, that's a lot of text if you consider a page of A4 text is about 2.5 kilobytes. That could be a diploma thesis. I don't recommend storing your diploma thesis on the tape, at least not nowadays. At least take two tapes, yeah? It's that easy. OK, uh, what is data? Shout it out to me. Go on, give me something. Uh, 
What is data? Stored information. Stored information. That's a very academic answer, but I, I concur, yeah. Something more practical? Text documents. Text documents, yeah. Cat pictures, absolutely. You want to back up those? Photos, videos, audio, your applications, scripts, configuration files, documentation. No, documentation is an illusion. Um, yeah, but pretty much everything else is, is data. Uh, and the problem at hand is pretty much that the storage media you've tasked to store your data to keep it safe, you trusted in them, and they lie to you and say, nope not giving it back to you. So you have data loss. It's tragic. Your bytes have gone to the fjords. You cannot retrieve them. There's no way to reproduce them or get them back. They're gone with the wind, like punch cards in autumn. Yeah, could be your photos from your last holiday trip. You could probably recreate them by going back there. <laughs> Unless it's 20 years in the future and that Caribbean island is now five meters underwater because of global warming. And there's other reasons you might not be able to recreate the data. You might have missed a friend that you traveled with. Or you had some computer magazines from the 70s and 80s. You can recreate data from them. You could type in that basic listing again, sitting hours. And that's how we distributed software back then. Um, yeah, have a look at the retro computing next door. Uh, it's really awesome. You can read about all these stuff there and see them. Um, who of you has lost data? Do you know a person who has lost data? Point the finger at them. Yeah, yeah, okay. Oh, that's a lot of hands. Um, yeah. How much could you lose? It's a five and a quarter inch floppy. It's made for the 8 bit Ataris. Hmm? A whole room drive with everything on it. <laughs> yep. 360K, that's 120, no, uh, that's 130 kilobytes or 160, depending on how old it is for these Ataris. For MS-DOS at later ages, you had 1.2 megabytes per side. You could flip those around, at least some of them. Some were meant to, some were not, but that was a possibility. So for backups, it would be a good idea to classify your data. Hmm, what could we use to classify data? Any criteria, ideas? How to classify your data? Importance, Importance okay. Easy to, Easy to reproduce. Good one. Uh, availability. availability yeah. Size. Size, yeah. Size matters, at least with backups. <laughs> so I was told. Okay. We had size, which boils down to amount. 2 to the power of n bytes. We usually count in bytes, it's easy. Um, and why is the amount relevant? Because data is not instantly reproduced. It takes time. It will come to that in the later moment. Uh, then we could think about change, bytes over time. How much data does it change over time from all the data I need to save? And how does my backup software cope with change of data? How well does it take that one? Uh, by criticality, we had importance already. Um, criticality is a very strange word. Critical to whom, for how long? Are your contacts, your contact information, your friends' contact information, is that critical data? You might have received an SMS by some unknown number. I have no idea who you are, but you were on my contacts and they were on my SIM card. Yeah, we could store contacts on SIM cards a few years ago. Um, your passwords, are they critical? Probably. I mean, it's good to have a backup of your passwords. Somebody else might benefit from that. <laughs> or your SSH or GPG keys. So, yeah. How much denial of service is in the data loss? Um, how much could you lose? It's, again, a five and a quarter inch floppy. It's still for an Atari, I think. Yeah, that's certainly one for now, Hari. What could you lose? What is important? If you have not played those, you've never lived in the 80s, you should play those. They're awesome games. They're hard. I mean, you could get a backup of the games. Just visit a friend and make another backup copy. But what about your high scores? 
You could reproduce them probably, not exactly, but roughly. And it might take you hours and days of playing Zaxxon or Buck Rogers or Stratos or whatever. So might be reproducible, but might not that be that easy. So relevance. Is that a criteria for data? How important is data? How relevant is it? In which kind of problems do I run while I don't have access to that data? Think of your GPG keys or SSH keys. Um, irrelevance. I don't mind if I lose that data. It's just cache files. There's no point in restoring them. They're invalid if I really need to restore them. So it might be a good criteria to find out which of your data is actually irrelevant to backup. You can save a lot of space and time with that. Um, how much could you lose? I promise I'll stop with the five and a quarter inch floppies at some point <laughs> further down the track. I'm not sure when, but it will, it will end. Um, these are originals, like not a backup, not even a pirated backup copy. These are originals. And what you could lose when this becomes unreadable by putting it into a binder, punching hole in archiving it in a binder. I mean, there's big letters. It's called IBM for a reason. They make money from licenses. You could lose a software license. And you could not just download the software again from the internet because it had not been invented yet. Or probably invented but not widely accessible. Unless you were a US American military contractor or university. But getting a license, that could be expensive. I mean, anyone encountered Oracle in their terms? This can be. Or is there a SEP field, somebody else's problem? <laughs> Your VM hoster is usually tasked with keeping that machines running and having a backup of those. Unless they don't, then it's your problem again. Think about it. Yeah, it's a three and a half, no, it's the safe icon. I'm, yeah, it's the safe icon. Uh, three and a half inch floppies. Hmm, how much could you lose? Depending on your operating system and platform between 720 kilobytes up to 1.44 megabytes or if you were really rich and had a next computer back then 2.8 megabytes they were pretty much the only ones who used those um, also an interesting question where is your data do you know I mean do you really know it's it's everywhere I'm pretty sure it's everywhere on your laptop on your home NAS device on some server in the cloud? I mean, external hard drives in your cupboard or elsewhere? Is that data on a SIM card? That phone number you don't remember who it was and sent that SMS to? It's somewhere. Think about it, where it is. What else could you lose? That is original Solaris uh, installation media for Sun. Um, I think it's Spark. 650 to 700 megabytes for a CD, 4.7 gigabytes for a single layer DVD, up to 8.5 gigabytes on a dual layer DVD, and that is without compression. Do you remember those CDs you could record yourself? Like burn a CD, you've done that, huh? I'm pretty sure, yeah, okay. I see nodding faces. You also know those, those labels you could print yourself and stick on them so they look professional? Don't do that with your backups, because if you peel off that label, yeah, I see some, fa some people who have seen this. Okay, uh, if you peel off that label, you'll also peel off the thin metallic layer that actually is responsible so that you can read back that data. Now you have a sticker with your data that you cannot read anymore, or it becomes really, really expensive. What else can we think about? Where is your backup? I know it's kind of fictional that you have one, but if you so desire to do one, where is it? Where would you put it? On a local drive? On an external drive? On some remote medium, a USB thumb drive? And in which couch have you lost that thumb drive lately? Is it on your key ring at home, at work? Do you have physical access to that medium? Can you get there and take a hard drive back to the office and copy back data from there? If not, how long does it take to get there and get the drive? or? Is that impossible? You need to use some kind of network. And thinking about backups, why not do multiple backups? But still think about where do you put them? Um, because media carries data, backups is just data, and data gets lost. 
So, well, now I need a backup of my backup. Probably not the worst idea you had. And also, what is your backup medium? We also, we already had hard drives. I mean, it's kind of obvious, floppies. Uncommon, unless you work it once upon a byte. Then there's lots of floppies. Magneto opticals, tapes, the cloud, microfiche, hard copies. I mean, you could print out data. That's a good thing. Or you could use one of these. It's a digital videotape, DV camera. That's pretty much tiny VHS tapes. 3.6 megabytes a second um, and around 70 gigabytes of data you could store there. There actually was software that would encode your data into video frames and put it on a videotape. 80 minutes, real time. That's how long it took to fill it. Um, and think about, is a backup actually possible? Can you back up your data? Are you sure? These are hardware tokens. It's kind of point of these things that you cannot copy the keys of these devices. And they actually have pretty active protection against that in many ways. So, no. Normally you cannot back up these things, at least most people cannot, and it's probably expensive and a lot of work to do so. Or a GPG smart card, or any other kind of smart card. Your phone has a smart card, it's called a SIM. It's also not meant to be copied, and most people will never copy a SIM card in their life. Let's talk about backup types. I can do different types of backup. That's the theory section now. You can go easy. Connect the thumb drive, drag over that folder in your graphical user interface or CP source destination and do a full backup. Just copy everything. That's easy. It's also the slowest way to copy. But at least you do have a copy from four weeks ago because you never updated it. Um, well, benefits, it's easy. Drawbacks, it takes a long time and it takes a lot of space. And Again, how much could you lose? That's a very close up, like really, really close up, of a flash card. Not compact flash card you might remember from cameras. It's a flash card, it's a full size flash card, about the size of a credit card and as thick as three or four of them. That one took 10 megabytes as it's written on it and it cost uh, around 100,000 Serbian dinars, roughly 800 euros and roughly corrected for inflation since this was a current piece of shit. Um, if you're Hungarian, 250,000 forint and 8,000 Austrian shillings back then in the 90s, early 90s. Um, and also, where's the laptop with that flash card drive that I can actually put those cards in to get some data off them, if you still have it? Um, there's incremental backups. You'll take one initial copy of everything, and then when you update it, you take the difference of what's new and the original backup and you copy that over. And you mark it with a date time and timestamp. And the next day you do the same thing again. And now you have a chain of backups. So if you want to restore, you copy back the first initial copy and then you replay all the increments. But might be inconveniently long if you have a lot of increments. But they take up less space, they go faster, while you do them, and the copy back problem, the, the restore problem, can be somehow improved by using a differential backup. You take one initial copy, and then you do a delta backup, and always reference the initial copy. So you, all, you only have to restore the initial copy and one delta. But your differences get larger and larger and larger, and at some point your difference is probably larger than the original copy. That's probably the point in time you wanna start with a fresh, full backup and go over it. And then some smart people came along and said, well, we can combine those two and make, make some kind of magic. Now you have a backup that solves these problems by being every backup restorable like one single full copy, but still preserving space and time while doing the backup. So this is something you probably want in your, um, in your backup software solution. How much could you lose? This should be recognized by more people. Huh? Zip drives, 100 megabytes, made by Fuji and iOmega. 
Later versions had 250 megabytes. That's a lot of MP3s now already, the few albums you could put on there. Um, and these cartridges were quite interesting because they had a digitally aging mechanism. So the drives were cheap, the cartridges were not. And the cartridges were refusing to be read back because the software said, well, this cartridge is too old, it's probably not good anymore, get a new one. Hmm. Interesting marketing concept. And there's also the criminal backup. It's surprisingly common. The more enterprisey your company is, the more common it is. So I heard. And that is somebody occasionally copies some data somewhere and hopes for the best. Some people think this is a good idea. Other considerations. Um, when making backups, like, okay, now I have the desire to make a backup. What are things I should also think about other than where and how and the duration. We already had the size. That directly affects how long does it take to copy. Because data does not just replicate instantly. Do I have a ton of small files? Do I have a few large files or many large files? Because writing a ton of tiny small files might take a lot of time. Not because your connection is slow, but there's a lot of overhead. For each file you have to write a directory entry with a name and a folder and all the metadata. So larger files usually tend to be faster than a lot of small files. Even the amount might be more. And what is the interface you're using to transfer that data? Is that an old narrow SCSI device? They were reliable as hell. Also expensive. They're still expensive SCSI devices which are faster. Or is that six gigabyte, six gigabit a second uh, SATA device, like a modern hard drive or SSD, or even an NVMe SSD with PCI Express, which is really fast these days? How much could you lose? That picture is not skewed. That's a three-inch floppy, and it's actually rectangular. Uh, thanks to Once Upon a Byte, the retro computing people who let me take a copy uh, two hours ago. Uh, it was used in the Amstrad CPC, Schneider CPC, 8-bit computer. It, for some reason, never really took off on the market. Everybody else went 3.5 inch, and it's about 180 kilobytes per side. You could also flip those over. Um, wonderful. Network bandwidth. You're not copying to a local location, but over a network to somewhere else. Um, do you have one of those shiny 10 gigabit ethernet links or 100 gig? Usually not, at least not at home, probably not at work. I know places who are still running on 100 megabit ethernet, if it's ethernet at all and not token ring. These things still exist. Do you have Wi-Fi to backup? Which iteration of Wi-Fi and how much interference on the 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz bands is still there? Or do you copy over your home DSL connection? I mean, that might be slow with the uplink. So your initial cloud backup that is oh so cheap might also take, oh, five months to copy for the initial copy. And then you gotta run deltas. I literally have occasions where a daily delta would take six weeks to copy off site. This is the state of internet at some countries in the world. Um, latency. Ethernet is usually fine when it comes to latency with milliseconds or sub-milliseconds. Um, that's nice. What about a GSM uplink? If you can't get a good DSL connection, some people go for an LTE or 3G link because that's a little faster at least than the DSL they can get. But GSM is rather high latency in comparison to Ethernet or a satellite link. That takes a long time to bounce back and forth. And if your backup software compares each file that you want to backup with the backup destination, back and forth, back and forth, those milliseconds or seconds, they add up a lot. So you spend more time waiting for an answer than you actually transferring data. You're not saturating a link. Um, or other latencies, especially with restore. There's a nice uh, data collecting company. They're called Amazon. They're not only selling stuff on the internet, they're also doing a lot of computing. And they have a product called Amazon Glacier. It's also glacially slow. Because if you want to get your data back after you pretty much uploaded it for free, 
the latency to start your backup is, depends on how much you pay. And the least latency they offer is five minutes. And you say, wow, huh, easy, five minutes. I mean, come on, I get a coffee or a second one because you don't pay enough and now you wait 12 hours for your backup to start. And then you download a few gigabytes or terabytes and it takes a few days until it arrives at your place. Now you have a caffeine addiction or probably intoxication. I don't know the LD50 of, of caffeine, but you can certainly reach it. Um, so think about latency. It's might, it might only be a few seconds or milliseconds, but they add up. Think about it. And then there's trust. Who, whom can you trust? Certainly not me. I would not advise you to do that. I would also not advise you to trust when I say, don't trust me. Make of that what we wish. Uh, can you trust your backup software? Are you sure? Who has access to that backup medium? Is there some kind of, no, documentation is illusion. There is no documentation on who has access to that media. Where is it? Is it stored properly? Can you trust that location? Is there a nosy admin who likes to poke into your files and maybe delete one or two? or change a byte in your encrypted backup, and now the backup software says, well, it's encrypted gibberish, and it does not work out. No, your files are gone. Think about it. Will your software give you the rest of the files that are not being manipulated? Or is it just everything in one go? And a single byte that has changed may cause your backup to poof, and it's gone. Common misconception? Please repeat after me, RAID is not a backup. Seriously, a RAID alone is never a backup. It might sound intriguing, yes. It isn't, trust me. It may reduce your downtime. That's the best thing you can get from a RAID. It may reduce your downtime to zero. That's a really good case. But it's never a backup. If your RAID fails, the data's gone as well. And RAIDs have so many ways to fail. It's wonderful. There's hard drives, there's cables, there's controllers, there's firmware in controllers, there's the enclosures. When lightning strikes, usually a lot of things break. And I'm pretty sure you don't have a hardware backup of that enclosure to put your drives into another enclosure with the same controller, with the same firmware version. Because the newer firmware does some magic and cannot read the disks from the old one. You know, some people are smiling, they have, con have survived this. So trust me, hardware, it's not a backup. Huh? Um, then, yeah, if you have backups, if you do have backups, so now you wanna do updates, think about how much data do you create between two backup runs? There's some window of opportunity to lose data. Use it. Um, during that time, yeah, you're at risk. It's annoying. Um, but you cannot constantly backup, that does not work. Comparing what to backup takes some time. And that's your hard limit on how often you can keep running that backup. Unless you do instant replication. Or what happens when you're offline? Ever try to backup your laptop while you're riding on a train? No? It's not worth it, it doesn't work. It's, you're pretty much offline, even, I mean, yeah. Train companies usually say, you get Wi-Fi they do not make any statements about routing. But it's good for a LAN party. So your cloud backup is now nice but unreachable. How much could you lose? Ugh. Confused. Yeah, that's a very rare thing. It's a DVD RAM. It's random access memory on a DVD. You could randomly read and write data. It's probably as fast as a common garden snail. And I might be exaggerating the snail at the moment. Um, but yeah, up to 5.2 gigabytes. These were also flippers that you could record on both sides. And you could even take out the DVD from the caddy and put it into a DVD drive and read it back. That's really weird things. They're so-called removable removables and non-removable removables, depending on which type they are. Um, yeah. You'll probably never see those again. Be happy about it. Um, and the amount per iteration, that's also something you should think about. Like, can I back up the amount that I need to back up during the time I have 
as opportunity for that. Usually you do backups in a company overnight because it, during the day people get annoyed because the internet is even slower and the server is slow and has something to do and probably some more important things. So you back up at night and now your data grows and um, this does not add up at some point. So think about how much data you can actually get rid of during the time you have to back up. This results in a frequency, how often you can do those backups. And since there's always overhead, there's a hard limit you hit at some point. How much could you lose? More realistic scenario these days. These are 10 terabyte hard drives, contemporary things. If you're quick with counting, these are 28 pieces. So in theory, that's 280 terabytes that you could lose instantly. Convenient. These, these exponential functions, they work. You can lose more data even quick, more quickly with modern technology. Love it. So uh, what are causes for data loss? What can cause your data to not come back from the trenches? How does it occur? Fire, exclamation mark. Hmm? Fire is usually not very friendly to hardware and IT. Uh, I've seen cars burnt out with a laptop on the seat. If you do get one of those, you might be lucky to get the data back, but please use protective gloves in a well-ventilated area. It's not a funny job to do. Um, so if you have a pancake laptop flambe, um, bad luck. Or your new shiny 3D printer, Yep, that's 280, 250, 210 degrees on your nozzle. That's good to burn things. What comes after fire? Water. Yeah, exactly. Water. So those few things that survive the fire will now drown in the fire extinguishing water or foam or whatever comes, whatever technology is used to this, uh, extinguish the fire. Data sensors are usually happy because they have like uh, CO2 uh, um, ways to, to extinguish a fire. But water is still common and floodings do happen. I've seen data centers with like this much water on the floor. Makes you wonder why UPSs, like uninterruptible power supplies, basically a large battery is always at the floor and now it's half underwater, mm. might cause a spark, and now your UPS burns from the water. Uh, let's not go there. Uh, defects, like physical defects. Hard drives, they are mechanical. Most storage media still is mechanical media, and mechanics fail at some point. It's not a question when, uh, how, uh, if they fail, but when they fail, and they will fail at some point. So if you have a RAID and you carry the hard drives from one point to another, never carry more than the number of redundancy you have in one hand. If you trip and you have one hard drive of redundancy and you drop two, you might kill them both. Yes, go with a single hard drive and go a few times. It might save your data, really. It's that easy. Um, other defects that can happen uh, your smartphones, they are really thin these days. They're not comfortable to sit on. And phones usually don't like, do not like to be sat on. They like to bend. This can cause your data to not be reachable anymore. It happens. Laptops are become, becoming skinnier as well. And you drop them into your backpack with tons of other stuff. Or they get, uh, yeah, we'll come to that. Um, how much could you lose? Hmm, what is that? 200 megabyte PsyQuest cartridge. They also came in 44 and 88 megabytes back then when the desktop publishing revolution was a thing. Um, these are basically a hard drive platter in a plastic case. Like literally the same platter that's now used in a hard drive is just taken out and put in the case. Does not sound too sturdy and reliable, but it was not too bad actually back then. <coughs> We sent a lot of them back and forth between publishing companies and printing companies by bicycle. Yeah. Works. 
Magnetic Fields. It's not only a great album by Jean-Michel Jarre from 1981, I can highly recommend it. Um, they're also part of how a mechanical hard drive works by applying a magnetic field and flipping bits in a magnetic layer of, of uh, metallic oxide. Um, and stronger magnetic fields tend to have an effect on those particles in your hard drive, unwanted effects, meaning your bits drop or flip or behave strangely. Um, there's also kinds of um, urban legends, uh, at least there's one that's really confirmed. It's by Deutsche Bahn, the German uh, railway company. Um, and it was late 90s where they had these, these flip-up tables on, on the front seat. And you have these knobs to keep it upright. Yeah, well, knobs are not fancy enough. You can use neodymium magnets. And magnets are great because they make flip this satisfying noise when you flip up the table. A similar noise is made by a hard drive when it cannot find the track information. It's tick, 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 tick. They're related. Because uh, usually a hard drive um, works at a field of 0.5 to 1 millitesla. That's not a lot of magnetic strength. The Earth's magnetic field is 50 micro tesla, 5 times 10 to the minus fifth. And these magnets, they usually come with 1 to 1.5 Tesla. So even if you count the distance of your hard drive from that magnet, if you put your laptop on that table, you're still 17 to 20 times way over the magnetic field the hard drive could take and still continue working. And you not only lost the data of that drive, but also the track information. So you could not even reformat that hard drive and reuse it. That was really gone for good. There were multiple occurrences. You can read it up on the internet. That's actually confirmed. So if you happen to work near um, an MRI or other magnetic larger fields, take care. Um, cold deformation, usually caused by some strong impact, either a car crashing into a wall or a bullet going through your laptop when you cross the border, usually Border Patrol does not know where your laptop's hard drive is. So you have a good chance they only shoot through the trackpad and miss the hard drive. I've seen photos of these laptops. People were happy they had a bullet in the trackpad and not in the hard drive. It happens. Or you just might trip over the stairs and your laptop goes boom, boom, boom. It happens. Surface disintegration, that's a very interesting one. Um, Mechanical hard drives, they have a metallic oxide usually brought up onto a, a glass or aluminum surface, like this tiny, very thin platter of glass or aluminum. And, or CDs and DVDs, they're polycarbonate. And there's also a very, very thin metallic layer on them that actually carries the data. And yeah, it's vapor deposited on that. So it's really, really a few molecules thick only. So if you peel off that label from the DVD, it's pretty much gone. And with hard drives, your, hard, your, your reading head flies over that hard drive platter, a few microns. It's a lot less than a human hair. It's actually less than a human fingerprint on a surface. So any mechanical force applied will cause the hard drive head to crash into that surface. And a mechanical crash means it will take off a few bits of this oxide. And if that happens often, and you open up the hard drive, you find some dark powder in it. That was your data. It's now distributed in a kind of tiny filter that protects the hard drive from it. Uh, it happens. Um, and now your hard drive starts either lying to you about the data it reads back, because it doesn't recognize the uh, surface damaged, which is inconvenient. Or it just says, well, there is no data. Sorry, Dave, I can't do that. Hmm. Another tape. These are really used for backups predominantly. 310 meters, if you come from one of those strange countries that still derives their lengths um, from barley corns, meaning imperial units, that's 1,020 feet, and it's about 525 megabytes. 
tapes are great. You put them in a drive, you copy the data on, you take out the cartridge and some of the tape stays in there and now it's a problem. You probably have seen that this in the 80s, 90s with your DVD, or now that, not DVDs, uh, tape recorders, VHS and Video 2000 or VCR, some kind of those. You can cut off a little bit and tape it together and yeah, really, you can glue it together. That was a common thing with cutting. I mean, the term cutter actually comes from doing that. But that piece is lost and your binary <laughs> might not like that. It will not run. Maybe it works for some other data. Other causes, theft or loss. Hmm. Well, burglary happens, so that's understandable. You'd be surprised by how many laptops are actually lost or forgotten on trains or airports. I have no idea how you could forget a laptop at an airport, but over half a million a year are lost in the United States alone. Half a million laptops. I mean, think what you could do with all that hardware. Somebody's selling hardware here. Um, Ransomware, another cause of loss. It makes encryption of your data really easy, so I heard. You might have seen one of Hetty's talks about ransomware in the last years. If you haven't, there's recordings of it. Watch them. He has a whole zoo of ransomware on his laptop. At some point, it will escape one of his VMs. Oh, you've seen his talk today. There's recordings of it. Uh, then there's deletion. Accidental, I mean, sometimes people delete data or some software, if you happen to be Steam and updating your Steam game client, and there's an RM command, like for delete files, and there's one space too much after you specify a path of your home directory, like tilde, slash, and then some path. A space in there can significantly alter the outcome of your RM command. And now you have no home directory anymore because somebody put a space in there. Or you have been adminning all night and you're not pretty sure about which machine am I working on? Which server is this? Is this the right host? Did I just delete the wrong directory? Oh, I was rude. I'm pretty sure I deleted that directory. I just don't know which was it, which it was. Hmm, yeah, happens. Still, it's accidental deletion. How much could you lose? Okay, gotta speed up this thing. 20 megabytes, it's an old hard drive. Already three and a half inch. Then there's deletion on purpose. Usually more effective than accidental deletion because you can pick and choose. That's good. Um, it also raises your adrenaline level. And how much it raises depends on if you deleted somebody else's data or if somebody else deleted your data. Makes a significant difference. Tried both? Can only recommend one. No, I no, cannot recommend it. How much could you lose? Magneto optical. 500 megabytes up to five gigabytes. Five and a quarter inches. Very slow, very reliable. A lot of these are in use in medical applications to backup data. And if you take a laptop with one or two storage media components, picture a scenario. What types of scenarios could happen? You could lose everything. The laptop's gone, the hard drive's died, the house burnt down, somebody grabbed it, ran away, you have a really efficient crypto ransomware, everything's gone, that's easy. You have a backup, you play back everything, you're good. Ideally at another location, works fine. If only one is gone, hmm. If you know where your backups are and where your data is and you don't mix them up on the same hard drive, that might be surprisingly convenient. Because you say, oh, I've backed up this hard drive to this hard drive and both are in my laptop. Just copy them back. Might actually be sufficiently enough. Um, okay, one last floppy. How much could you lose? Subtle hint. Oh, that's an installer. And installers were basically a raid striped across multiple floppies. And if you lost the first of your six floppies, well, you now have five free floppies to do something else with. <laughs> Isn't it great? That was actually Space Quest 3, I think. Yeah, a backup, of course. Uh, around seven megabytes if you take six floppies. Yeah, 
your laptop can become defective, lightning strikes, you plug in the wrong power supply, your CPU may die from something, your RAM goes up and it's soldered to the motherboard. This fancy laptop comes with these things. Cables break, hmm, inconvenient. But think about what would you do with when that happens. Data integrity, that's the same thing with flakes coming off your hard drive, surface platter. Because if you write data to a disk and you read it back, is that the same data you wrote out? Are you sure? How would you make sure? It would be a file system's job to make sure it detects a lie from the hard drive. There's only a few uh, file systems that can actually detect corrupted data when read back from disk. Are you using one of those? Do you know one of those? CFS. Uh, CFS, okay, that's a very good choice. There may be a few others, but if not, hard drives lie. They lie about their sector size, about their cluster size, about their RAM, about their, I mean, some even, some SSDs even tell you they have 63 sectors, 16 platters, and four heads. <laughs> Where exactly? Hmm. Okay. So, your desired goal, of course, if you do have backups, is a restore. One thing I can highly recommend is test your restore. Without testing your restore, you don't have a backup. And also think how much or which parts do you want to restore? A single record in the database? The whole database? Can you even do that? Are you sure? A calendar event? A V card from your address book? You know the question? It's an iOmega Jazz drive. They're basically the larger uh, sibling of, of zip drives. They had up to a gigabyte and later two gigabytes. They're one or two hard drive platters in a cartridge. Actually, it was pretty fast and compared to hard drives, they were cheap. So, hmm. now the quick part. What could go wrong when doing backups? There's this tiny hint in the subtitle on the slide. Let's have a look. Empty backups, and I mean, if you back up to def null, there's always enough space. <laughs> and it's super fast. Really, it's incredibly fast. It's not incredibly reliable as a medium. Um, make sure you're actually writing that data out and not addressing the wrong drive, tape, device, host, whatever destination you're using. You might be surprised how often that happens. And you think you have a backup. How do I remedy this problem? Try testing an actual restore. There's something strange coming back. You know who to call. Um, backups may be unreadable because if you don't store your DVDs, should you do your backups to uh, CDs or DVDs, they might not survive bad storage. Actually, DVDs are laminated layers, they're glued together. And with some manufacturers, that glue is an organic substrate. There's fungus and bacteria who feed on that substrate. So your backup DVDs might actually get eaten. It's not incredibly helpful for reading those data, but you'll certainly see it when it happens. So please store your data and your media dry and dark and take care of it. Um, also try to read it back regularly, and if it breaks, you know what to do. Your backup medium might be unretrievable, so you have a backup medium, but you cannot get to it or get it back, because I know there's a tape out there, I have no clue where it is. We've changed location now two times, it might get lost at some point. Um, or uh, which one was it? If you have no dimension what that is, that is a tape library. You know what a 19 inch rack is? It's basically two meters high, like a person. Take six of those side by side and put in 14 tape, hard, uh, tape drives and fill the rest with tapes. This is basically find your bits. So that's a huge puzzle. Um, yeah, and the robot drives in there up and down and picks a cartridge and puts it in. It's incredibly relieving to see this thing work. I have more photos if you come to me afterwards, I can show you a few. Um, then there's credentials. Um, 
you encrypt your backups, of course you do, because you have sensitive data. You don't want anybody else to have access to your data. Uh, you do use a password manager because you want to use good passwords. And where's the data of your password manager? Oh, it's in that backup. Hmm. You're listening, good. Bonus episode. Um, you're smart, you're also copying that password manager's data to your phone. That's good. If somebody steals your phone as well because it's in your carry-on on the flight, Ah, dang, there's a problem. And even if you have a cloud backup of that, you get a new phone. Oh, cool, new Android or new iOS. And the app you used for your passwords is not sold anymore. And you don't have a backup of the old app. And the, old, the new app cannot read the database format of the old app, probably, or convert it. So think about the software part as well. Keys, some of you may or may not use SSH or GPG keys. What do you do when you cannot access them? Your backup is on a remote server via SSH because that's an encrypted transport and it's working fine. And now you can't access your backup because your keys are not accessible at that moment when you need them because you're on your laptop and your laptop's gone. <coughs> the same applies to passphrases for keys because your keys have passphrases because if somebody gets access to your keys, you don't want them to use them. And you know where your passphrases are in your password manager. Yeah. You can make up that story on your own. Um, and then there's physical media. Can you actually connect that media to a new computer? Like if you have SCSI drives, can you actually get a new SCSI card? Does it work? Or you know these fancy new laptops, they have USB-C, but your hard drive has a USB-A connector. Do you have the necessary cable or adapter? Can you get it on a Saturday afternoon? I think that's a convenient shopping time. Hmm, might be a problem. Simple as that, I cannot plug it in anymore. Uh, not a floppy, optical drive, three and a half inch, 230 megabytes you could lose, quite easy. Um, the capacity, you had a laptop with a one terabyte hard drive, your new laptop has only a 512 gigabyte SSD because it's fast but it's also expensive and you have a terabyte to restore but that does not fit on your SSD. Can you tell your software to only restore a part of it and get up to a running system very quickly and then decide what to do with the other half, half a terabyte? I mean, I know a lot of software that cannot do that and it's really inconvenient when you, because copying half a terabyte and then when the software finds out, uh, no, that does not work. It's inconvenient if you find out after a few hours. Um, Networks, yeah, gigabit ethernet is fine. 100 megabytes a second, that's okay. If you need it faster, connect storage locally, that's usually helping. But if you use ethernet, does your laptop even have ethernet these days? And then you can spin up the whole thing about adapters again, having it at hand. Um, and you say, ha, don't use ethernet, use Wi-Fi. Where's your Wi-Fi password? Okay, we already had the part with the controllers and rates and HPAs. A new firmware version can wreak havoc on data. I've seen it too many times, it's not fun. Um, partitioning schemes, some proprietary rate controllers also have very proprietary partitioning schemes. They may put the protective uh, master boot record on there so other things say, oh, it's a full disk and I don't touch it, it's a good thing. And other things say, oh, it's something I cannot read and don't touch it. Hmm. Also inconvenient, probably. Same goes for file systems and manufacturers. Uh, even enclosures from the same manufacturer might run into problems. Um, there's a Olympus XD card used in digital cameras from one manufacturer. 32 megabytes. You cannot even buy card readers that can accept physically this type of medium anymore. Many years. So. If you find a camera somewhere and there's one of these, good luck finding a uh, an adapter for it or a cable. Operating systems, also a unique kind of failure point. Um, you're running one LTS version of something and when you want to restore, there's a new one and the new one does not either run your backup software anymore because 
the next macOS app, uh, version will not run 32-bit applications anymore. And it's not 64-bit, which you notice then at the most inconvenient point in time. The laws apply. Um, can you downgrade the OS? Does the license you have for that software or operating system work on that new hardware? Are you sure? Ever tried to call Oracle about that license thing on the new? Might cause your adrenaline level to rise. Um, and then, of course, there's not so proprietary operating systems. You might be running BSD or Linux. And then you find out that this piece of software does not link to this version of glibc anymore for some reason. And now you need to find an old compiler to actually build old software. Builds up stress. The ransomware part, yeah. Now you have encrypted backups and encrypted data, or multiple times encrypted data. Makes recovery not an easy task, usually. And with the integrity of files, yeah. You have seen those JPEG files. Some might be blocky, but some may have like a half that's gray. You probably have seen those from a defective camera or phone memory. Hmm? See a few people nodding, yeah. This is a single bit flip. One bit that flips that can cause a JPEG to become gray and be unusable. So it does not take a lot of damage to data of, to um, su suffer from bit rot. And that usually works with a lot of file formats, especially binaries are happy with this. File systems, some use compression, some don't. And if you use a compressed file system, if you copy that data elsewhere, it gets uncompressed. So it becomes more data. And now your storage medium is suddenly a tiny bit too small to restore that data. Can be inconvenient. Also compressing and uncompressing also takes time. Might actually speed up things, but it might not. Have your things tested. Compact flashcards, they're used by some video cameras and photo cameras still. Um, yeah, they come up to a half a terabyte now, and there were actually hard drives in that size as well. And getting into future territory, your application, hmm. if it runs, that's fine. It runs on your new operating system, that's fine. It runs on your laptop on your new one or new server, that's also fine. But to get a restore, you need to install that software. And then you find out that the installer will not work anymore. That's really inconvenient because now you get to have to find some old machine to restore that, to install that software and somehow move it over to the new system and hope that it works there. I've seen these things, they happen, they are really inconvenient. And there's UEFI. Some computers still boot legacy BIOS to initialize the hardware. Others are working with UEFI. And come 2020, major computer manufacturers will drop BIOS for booting. And if you have some medical application that might not be the most modern thing, which they usually aren't, it might not actually boot anymore on modern hardware if you must run it on hardware and cannot virtualize it. Even then, you need a BIOS emulation. Those will stick around longer for exactly that reason. So please, have a backup concept. The simple 3 to one rule, there's many interpretations of it. Data exists if you have three copies of it. Have two copies local, or use two technologies to backup, because if one fails, you have another one. And keep at least one backup externally, like physically separated for the fire exclamation mark hazard. Do generations, like recent data has more frequent backups, and as time fades, you increase the interval that you keep data, that reduces the amount you need to store, but still somebody will find out they deleted a file six months ago, and you better have a backup of that old file, even if it's not the last version, but some version is still better than nothing. And please, test your restore. There's so many things that can fail with backing up. Double this, this uh, and you get the times you have problems with restore. And if it takes a little longer, like these few terabytes, this is actually the caching device only. That's three racks full of hard drives for caching only. That is used to cache the data to, for the tape library you see earlier. Because those tapes, they need a constant data rate that you cannot provide over 
the usual company network. You cannot, these are able to saturate eight gigabits a second fiber channel constantly. So you need to cache data to actually make real use of some backup medium. If you're in that position, talk to me later. I'd be interested in that. And automate your backups. Backups that are done manually are done once and never again. Please, everything else is wishful thinking. Automate your stuff. Test it again and test from zero. Really do a full bootstrapping test from zero. Because you might find a point where all your encryption is really handy to keep your data safe, but it's also keeping your data safe from you because you've missed one piece to get that password to bootstrap the whole process. And that can really be inconvenient. Hmm. 10 by 15 bytes if you do that. Questions? <laughs> can we do one, 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 two questions probably? We're over time already. I get an okay. Okay, two questions. One over there. Uh, what backup software do you use? Uh, what backup software do I use? Well, I use multiple, of course, and what I use is probably totally irrelevant to your use case. Um, you need to ask a lot of those questions you've seen and find a solution that suits your use case. I'll happily tell you after the talk what I personally use, but that might totally not apply to your use case. So, those were the question was. One last question. Yep. So, one of the applications of encrypting uh, backup is also to, to uh, lose the keys to the backup so that you can basically get rid of the storage media without having to erase it safely. So yeah. if you have a hard drive and you do a backup on it, you don't have to erase it because yeah. you don't have the key anymore. You just yeah. drop the key. Um, how good of an idea does it sound to be and how good of an idea is it actually? I mean, have you, have you had experience with this in practice and seen it work? or? Is like, this something that just sounds really great on paper and then... Do you mean software that does encryption or do you mean mm. these self-encrypting hard drives? No, no, like, no. I mean software that does the encryption and then you have a certificate authority or whatever, a key store, uh -huh. that basically starts dropping keys after a certain while so that backups that are too old basically ah, okay. so they automatically, automatically, age out, yeah. you know, automatically expire. Okay. Uh, because it sounds nice, but somehow to have a, uh, an automatic mechanism that just drops keys after a while mm -hmm. feels like you have this sword hanging over your head and you, it's going to bite you in the ass. That's how it feels. I, yeah, do you have experience with this? Uh, I have no personal experience with these systems. I know a l very little about them. But having a third party probably or even a first party manage your keys, well, it's key management. That's already a lot of work to do. And it boils down to trust. Can you trust them to not, I mean, they might be making backups of your keys because the ones that you want to have, they would not want to lose. But who takes care of deleting the old keys in their backups? So that's, it boils down to trust. I mean, maybe managing your keys yourself solves the trust problem, but it's still a lot of work and it's key management, so. But it will solve the problem of having hard drives leaving your company and nobody being hopefully able to reproduce any data. Well, that's it. Thank you. Hit me up on the internet or I'm around at the conference. Thank you very much.